people did not mind if I tape recorded the thing. Now, this in fact is of the, is of the late 1970s when I did this work. So the tape recorder was going on and it was recording these mantra and the first time I was seeing the whole ritual being, uh, being carried out. The person who had been bitten by a snake, he was tied with a sacred thread around the place where he was bitten and this thread was supposed to protect him and of course the mantra were in honor of the snake god, local god called Gogaji. The, it began. Now, each mantra, I need your kind attention, each mantra, each holy litany had a combination of deities from two different religious systems. Each mantra had, this is fascinating, each mantra had Bismillah or Rahman or Rahim, which actually is from, from, from Islam. And also the names of the Hindu gods and goddesses like Ram, Lakshman, Sita, and, and others. I found it very fascinating. And as you know, when you are doing your field work, in the course, you know, you have hypotheses. The hypotheses emerge. What the grounded theory approach says, that hypotheses emerge from below. So some hypothesis came in my mind with respect to, with respect to, to composite culture, with respect to the, to the coexistence of different religious system and some kind, of a, some kind of a composite culture. I immediately opened my notebook just to commit this hypothesis to writing. And the moment I started writing, this man stopped halfway and said, please do not write and I will take you back to the, the, the opposition, the juxtaposition of oral verbalization and written verbalization. Against this backdrop, we have to understand this. This man said that immediately he stopped. Halfway, he was, he was reciting the, the holy litanies. He stopped and he said, don't write any of these mantra. Otherwise, they would become inefficacious. They would lose their charm. They would lose their power. Don't write them. Of course, you have to comply with this. And he stopped. And of course, of course, after this, he began with his, with his work. I did not write anything later. But all these mantra, they were recorded in my, in my tape. They are still still with me, and in fact, I have never written them down. I would remind, I would just, I'm reminded of that one uh, uh, afternoon when I was working on a paper which actually dealt with the gods of the by roads. Uh, you know, in Rajasthan, various uh, deities or shrines which are close to the roads. I thought of writing something on uh, the snake god, and I thought of using these mantra, and I was immediately reminded of that man, what he had told me, and so they have never been written down. Now, then some years later, this was the second episode when we went to do a piece of field work with the Baigas, the Baigas of, uh, of uh, uh, Satpura Forest Range, which actually now is in Chhattisgarh. And, uh, and uh, we were working, we were working with them. And when a similar kind of a thing came up, and this is something which I would like to, to, to draw your attention. You see, on the Baigas, you know, there's a lot of anthropology in my, in, my, in my speech. On the Baigas, there was a piece of work which was carried out by Verrier Elvin. And the book was published in 1939. And in this book, Verrier Elvin, with the help of the local interpreters and the translators, he in fact documented all these spells which are used by the, 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 the Baikas. And uh, we were collecting the same spells from one of the respondents. And what was amazing was the fact that the spells which Elvin had recorded in his book and the spells which this person was t telling us were identical. Incidentally, I had the book with me. So I was able to, to compare and see that they are 
they are the same. It's the same words and same. And at that time, at that time, this man noted, I wrote about this in an article which was published in Economic and Political Weekly many years ago, about this particular incident. And this man looked at me, and he was a little perturbed that every time, every now and then, I was looking into the book, which I was carrying a fat book, almost running into 500 pages or so. So he asked me, what is this all about? And I said, well, this is a book on your community, the Baigas, published in 1939 by this British anthropologist who started his work as a missionary. And all these mantra are there. He became very grave. And then he said that, look, look, do not write these mantra. He told me the whole story. And you know, I, what I'm saying is, these are the people who believe in it. And where the oral tradition, the orality, has a different status and a different etiquette to begin with. So, so he said that there are two goddesses. Now, this is the local point of view. And these people who have their own native religion, they're called the Baigas. And it is one of the primitive tribal groups of Madhya Pradesh and, and Chhattisgarh. So, so he said, there are two goddesses. And this was not the view held by just one person. This is the view of the entire community. There are two goddesses. One is called the goddess of, of writing. The goddess of writing. And this goddess of writing is called Kali Ma. Kali is black and it is the, the euphemism is, the euphemism is black letters, eh? Kali Ma. Kali Ma is the goddess of the black letters. And the other goddess is called Sun Ma. And Sun Ma is the goddess of the words. You know, the contrast of eye and the, and the ear. Oral verbalization is ear-based, and written verbalization is eye-based. So, so these two goddesses, Sun Ma and Kali Ma, the story goes among the Baigas. These two, two goddesses had conflict among them. Each one of them was claiming the superiority of her knowledge, written and the oral. They had a conflict. And finally, the conflict became so acrimonious that they decided to reach the god, the higher god, for some kind of intervention. The god intervened, the higher god, in the in the present context, the God is none other than Lord Shiva. The God intervened and the God said, the God said that, that in so far as the knowledge of the religious spells is concerned, in so far as the knowledge of the religious tradition is concerned, there should not be any control of Kalima. In other words, these litanies should not be written down. Should not be written down. And once again, and it was a little amazing because the cultural context is very different. The first cultural context is Rajasthan, and the second cultural context is, is Chhattisgarh. The first cultural context is of a caste community. And by definition, caste communities are in relationship with the, with the other community. The second context is one which is a tribal community, and that too, a primitive tribe, a primitive tribe, which is a special category within the scheduled tribe. Today, the primitive tribes are known as particularly vulnerable tribal groups, according to the draft of the National Tribal Policy 2000, 2006. Now, so, Context is different, but see how religious knowledge is, 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 is protected, that these mantras should not be written down. And this would remind me of the latest fieldwork. I just finished another round of fieldwork in Udaipur, this time with a community of the Peels. In fact, I returned on the 14th March after, after this fieldwork. And this was amazing that, uh, that uh, uh, we spoke to a large number of the bees regarding their what is known as traditional knowledge. 
we don't like the word indigenous knowledge so traditional knowledge something you know which uh, which they have something which has been a result of cross fertilization of the ideas and the knowledge which is which is held and there again the same thing came up in fact i would like to quote i would like to quote one of the ritual specialists among the bheels of udaipur the village is called ragunathpura which is one of the interior villages near the uh, the, the 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 national highway and he said the sentence was mantra ko pakana padta hai this is what he said and i'm quoting it that all these mantra they have to be literally cooked but how you cook them that's the important thing you cook them by reciting by making these mantra a part of your your breath now if you put these field experiences and i'm sure you must be having other experiences of the similar similar kind and they would all remind you if you have some understanding of what socrates said about writing this is a very famous statement i i read in when i was a student writing is inhuman this comes in socrates writing is inhuman why it is inhuman because writing writing takes away the dynamism of the words the dynamism of the orality and if you allow me to use some other expressions for this what writing does it it fossilizes it museumifies a fossilization of the the entire thing so the kind of dynamism which can occur in the form of this oral oral tradition where people talk where ideas come where ideas are debated after all after all brainstorming has been an essential part of the entire entire tradition then you would find you would find that that not withstanding not withstanding the fact that written verbalization has become central to to this whole thing uh, we still give precedence to orality orality in terms of certain kinds of tradition and obviously ritual traditions come come first in that i think if you ever have a study of various schools in varanasi which teach various texts or in deoband you would find emphasis is on oralization of the entire knowledge making the knowledge a part of of yourself and and a scribal culture is still persistent i mean please don't think that a scribal culture has come to an end i studied <coughs> the jain monasteries and where you find that these jain uh, munis you know during the the uh, afternoon hours when they are comparatively at leisure what they do is they copy down the texts they copy down the exactly in the same way as they were done done earlier of course these texts are also available in print form although some of them may not be available in print form so <clears throat> so they still write it uh, write it down thus thus the significance of the orality with respect to with respect to this now ong says and these are some of the final points which i would like to place place before you that ong says says that that a comparative study of cultures in different parts of the world say that that of hundreds of thousands of dialects and spoken languages only very few of them have the written verbalization he counted not more than this was a survey of 1971 not more than 178 of them this is this is ong's work that not more than 178 of them which have some kind of a written tradition then then many of these languages and dialects 
do not have their own script and therefore the script which has been adopted is one of the established script it could be devanagari it could be roman or it could be arabic you know in which this language is is written although we should not discount the fact that some of these languages have tried to devise their own script which is in fact is a part of the revitalization movement which are taking place in tribal communities one of the famous examples is of the santhals the santhals have their own script and this script is called old chiki and this script was the result of the work of a man called ragunath murmu murmu actually in santhali language means means wise so he devised this 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 script which actually has has alphabets from bangla from assamese from from hindi and some his own creation and some kind of a some kind of a script has come but most of these scripts happen to be roman or devanagari in which that particular dialect is written. it would apply to many of the of the languages of the northeastern communities where where is a roman script which is which is used so even today even today a large number of such these oral traditions continue now the question is that what should be done <clears throat> one is that we try to record these oral traditions and here you know the the question which come that uh, that there is a difference of opinion huh, with respect to how they have to be recorded if you if you subscribe to the views of the the people in rajasthan those who cure snake bites the cases of snake bite or the baiga shamans the baiga medium person or you subscribe to what the bheels have to say that religious knowledge or religious litanies are one which have to be understood orally orally and then then the local idea that if they are written down then they would be rendered inefficacious surely one can say that this idea has been adopted because they want to keep the religious knowledge esoteric and also not just esoteric but also above every other kind of knowledge so that one is able to give a particular kind of attention to 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 this so this knowledge is held sacred and as you know but perhaps you know we'll have to invoke durkheim here the sacred things are set apart and forbidden in the same way these things have to be set apart and forbidden so all these principles apply so the bheel would say that do not write these mantra and if you have to do you learn them <clears throat> so the oral recording of these actually some of the museums as a footnote i am telling you that some of the museums those who specialize in recording indigenous knowledge those who specialize in keeping a record of all this knowledge they give a lot of emphasis to orality so the recordings of the entire thing so you can go and you can listen to this so not everything should be available in the written form it should be available in the form of of what is what is said the word the flavor of 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 that so you find that there has been has been a dialectical relationship between oral aspects and the print and no one is here no one is here denigrating the print culture and no one is denigrating the print revolution although some very important ideas have come with this many important changes have come and one of the important changes is and this will be the last point before i finish in another 3 to 4 minutes is about authorship you have this whole corpus of of the the oral tradition songs riddles folklore okay story who has authored them who has authored them is there anything called after bernard cohen's work is there anything called collective authorship where 
ideas are very important where the tradition is very important and not the person who created these ideas or the tradition i think if you look into the writings of the people michel foucault included that how the author emerged because there was no question of an author in earlier time in earlier time if you go back to the ancient times and later on you'll find that the sources of knowledge were primarily two number one knowledge came either from your teacher that's the first and second is knowledge was revealed it came from outside an external source of this knowledge and it was it was i think in the middle in the mid 18th century that you find that the source of knowledge instead of being exteriorly you know situated it became interiorly situated so the inspiration to write came from within and once the source of knowledge was shifted from exterior thing to interior some kind of an author was born Hmm? and then later on the author became the founder of a particular school of understanding fish uh, foucault said F the the school of discursivity someone who is producing a new kind of of idea how individual authorship <clears throat> authorship came up now this is a very very important idea about the the authorship how it came up in fact if you look at look at when scribal culture came the writer was a part of the process of producing the text this is very interesting the writer was a part of the process like he was like the type founder like the type setter like the printer he was a part of that part of the entire thing so the writer did not occupy a different role so the role which was occupied by printer by type founder by type setter was the role of the writer and these writers were dependent upon upon their patrons huh? and in the system of this this patronage what was happening at the local community at the local community is community people out of their wisdom would add a line or would add a concept and the tradition will grow in fact at one time i became quite interested in working on a particular song from rajasthan which is called ghumar song and the famous song is mari ghumar chai nakhradi re ghumar ramba main jasa so this song is sung in almost all parts of rajasthan interesting thing is who is the writer of the song who is the author of the song you would find i collected because i spent a long time in rajasthan traveling from one part to the to to the to the other and making recordings of uh, of the song and because i i also enjoyed singing the song so i was able to have some kind of a true participant observation i recorded the song in different parts the tune remains the same the first line remains the same but different lines are added to this in fact what i found was when people sit and talk you see someone comes with a new line others like that line the moment they like this line they make that line a part of the body of the song in in this, in this way the song grows collective authorship becomes the major principle here the focus is on to recapitulate is on the idea is on the tradition rather than on on the 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 other thing now this idea of dynamism which is lost when we res resort to verbal with with got written verbalization this kind of dynamism which is lost i mean simple thing the books don't answer your questions the book would say what it has said earlier earlier it is not like what in sanskrit we call shastrarth in which you ask something i will reply and this process will will go on that kind of a <clears throat> dynamism is 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 missing and thus verbal 
written verbalization performs a different kind of a function, especially for posterity. Thus, thus, what is that all these people say? Whether you have some very important contributions in this. Ong was one. You know, Marshall McLuhan was another one who made very important contribution, <clears throat> contribution to this, especially to, to the approach of the linguists who have been almost overwhelmingly concerned with the written text and not with the spoken, spoken tradition. All these, you know, essentially point out that, that orality is, is an important subject of study. That is why we have in linguistics people giving a lot of attention to what is called ethnography of conversation, how people actually, actually converse. This would also explain that notwithstanding what is called silent reading, which came actually with the, after medieval times it came up, the silently you are reading, orality still remains one of the important aspect and how orality is actually <clears throat> orality is the prime mover of the dialectics of ideas most of these ideas emerge in the courses of, the, of these kinds of oral tradition oral traditions to sum up and this is what jack goody said oral tradition should not be viewed as frozen <clears throat> They should not be viewed as unchanging. They are continuously changing because they are always put into use, operas, operationalized, unlike what are the written tradition. So this dialectics of orality and the dialectics of written verbalization, this continues. Now, Against this backdrop, if one looks at what is happening with respect to the whole tradition, <clears throat> Of the, of the Nagas, you'll find the same kind of thing. Please don't think that the traditions are not being, uh, not being built. Whether it is, I don't know much about other communities, whether it is the Feast of Merit, or it is various kinds of taboos which are observed in the community, the traditions are is still being built. Orality is, <clears throat> orality is one of the prime movers of dynamism, prime movers of change. Thank you very much.